The Green Bay Packers have a new look on defense as Brian Gutekunst pulls off a bit of a masterclass once again in the second round of the NFL draft. Let's break down day two of the NFL draft with two very good picks. Very good picks by Brian Gutekunst. But the second half of the night, I was left a little bit more confused. Good morning, and thank you for enjoying it with the Six Pack, the Scotty Six Pack. The only podcast talking all things Packers, Badgers, Brewers, Bucks, and beyond six days a week. I'm your host, Kedrick Stumbrus. You can find me on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at Kedrick Stumbrus, and follow the podcast at Scotty Six Pack for the latest in Wisconsin sports. It is 11.32 p.m. Lambo time. It is late on Friday, April 26th. And whew, it's been a marathon. A seven hours Seven hour evening. Yeah, seven hours isn't that long in a big sports day, but for an evening on a Friday with more NFL draft tomorrow, it's been a long day. It's been quite a long day and, and we're, we're going to get into all of it, all of it. And look, we got if you didn't notice in the last show, we got like a background. We got stuff now behind me. I've lived here for uh, like eight months or something like that. And I'm finally <laughs> moving in. Um, it's fun. It's fun to be here talking with you all about a, a very exciting night for the Green Bay Packers. One that I said on yesterday's show could be the night that we look back on as the pivotal moment that actually carried the Packers to a Super Bowl title. And it started with the Packers trading back. Um, this is how it started. And really, the Packers, when they traded back with their first pick of the night at 41, something I was excited about, the Packers having, you know, just you only had to wait nine picks until the Packers were on the clock again tonight. Well, didn't didn't matter because the Packers didn't end up making that pick at 41. But the path to Green Bay picking at 41 really started on Thursday night, I think. Because if you think about the Packers pick at 25, the Eagles took the first corner to go off the board, the first cornerback in Quinion Mitchell out of Toledo, just three picks before Green Bay picked at 25. Then at 24, the Detroit Lions traded up to get just ahead of the Packers and take another corner in Terry and Arnold. It was pretty clear that teams either knew or thought that Green Bay was positioning itself to take a corner. And we'll get back to the or thought of that near, you know, the the end of this first segment. Then we got to Friday afternoon. Before round two of the draft actually kicked off, because there was an there was a report from NFL Network that Green Bay was making calls trying to move up on Friday. Brian Gutekunst kind of addressed this in his presser on, on Friday evening after the action had wrapped, saying that he was thinking about opportunities to move up, thinking that he really wanted to go get some players, and other members on his staff were kind of talking him down from the path of trading up with all the capital that he had. Another team that NFL Network, as part of that report, said had an interest in trading up was the Philadelphia Eagles who had already taken a corner in round one just before the Green Bay Packers picked. As the actual draft night comes, Green Bay doesn't actually come around to trading up. Brian Gutekind stayed put. He ended up trading down. But before that, the Philadelphia Eagles traded up just before the Packers to grab cornerback Cooper DeGene out of Iowa. A very, very, very fan favorite for the Green Bay Packers for, you know, Green Bay Packers fans, I should say. Clearly, Packers couldn't make a move up work for them. Knew this was a risk that maybe a player they really like gets taken off of their board. Don't know for sure whether or not Cooper DeGene is that. But right after Cooper DeGene goes off the board, the New Orleans Saints, who traded up to that spot with the Packers, take Kool-Aid McKinstry, another cornerback out of Alabama. Now, Kool-Aid has a foot injury, a 
I, I think it's called a Jones fracture. It, it is a bone near your pinky toe, something that can get um, injured with some regularity due to lots of stress and weight being put on that foot over and over again. We talked about this a little bit on yesterday's show. Uh, this, is, this is a medical concern for some staffs, and maybe the Packers had that concern. So th there, there is a theory here which says the Packers ended up trading back because they couldn't find a deal that they liked to move up. Risked the Eagles taking Cooper DeGene. Packers didn't feel very happy about DeGene not being there anymore. Didn't like the other players available that were going to go around that part and felt comfortable moving down four spots. And because of the pick that ended up coming in there from New Orleans, clearly the Packers weren't high on the medicals for Kool-Aid McKinstry. There is another thought, though. One that Brian Gutekunst did address in his, you know, post round three presser in saying that in the second round, when he claimed the team did not trade down in the second because Cooper DeGene went off the board, he said in that particular round, our board was very, very strong. He had also mentioned that he wanted to add picks, even though they didn't, because they didn't do that on day one. He also mentioned that he might be interested in adding even more picks on day, on day three. We'll get to that at the very end here uh, of the show. But I think a more likely explanation here is the Packers just actually like their corners. And this belief that the Packers need to take a cornerback, we're going to take a cornerback, is kind of new and in vogue almost. It became put such part of a, the mainstream consciousness for, for Packers fans, for the larger Packers commentariat to say, yeah, cornerback is kind of a key piece that the Packers are clearly going to add. The need for corner was a very early draft season debate. The One of the first references I found to it in talking about it was back in February, like immediately after the Super Bowl. It seemed to end up being such common wisdom that the Packers were cornerback needy, even though back then there was real discussion about it, you know, two months ago. feels like a very long time ago. But the Packers front office has said and did all the right things to convince you, the fan, that they actually liked their cornerback room. They seem to be very high on the Allentines, Valentine and Valentine. They still have the option to pick up the fifth year option on first round pick Eric Stokes. They have Jair Alexander in the room and at a corner, oh, kind of a corner, but they paid Keyshawn Nixon like he can play in the nickel spot, not just at free and strong safety. Something at the combine at the NFL combine that Brian Gutekunst really wants his safe safeties to be able to do. <laughs> and like I've said at so many other points of the show already, something we'll circle back to later on in this conversation. I think the Packers actually just liked their corners and this very in vogue conversation that happened and, and became just part of the mainstream consciousness. The Packers were cornerback needy, just ended up not being true. Maybe it is true. Maybe we look back on this season and think they really should have taken a corner. They should have taken a Cooper DeGene. Maybe the Packers just didn't like the options at corner, and maybe they liked Terry and Arnold, and he was gone off the board because Detroit traded in front of the Rain Bay to take him. Maybe they liked Coyne and Mitchell, and he went off the board because the Eagles took him a few picks ahead. The Eagles had some serious needs at corner, and just as bad, if not worse, than the need that Green Bay had. And that's not to say that Green Bay didn't do its job on defense, and not even in the secondary. Because Brian Gutekunst found two bona fide starters for Green Bay on day two of the NFL draft. It started with that pick at 45, that New Orleans Saints pick that Green Bay went back to go get. Along in that trade, Green Bay picked up a fifth and a sixth round pick in the process, so uh, I think that's some solid draft capital for them, for them to add. They get Edger and Cooper out of Texas A&M at 45 on Dane Brugler's consensus on Dane Brugler's big board. He was 46th overall. 
37th on Arif Hassan's consensus big board and 39th on the athletics consensus big board. So that uh, Packers did pretty well to get, get Edger and Cooper at 45. There were some people who thought that you weren't going to be able to get Edger and Cooper at 41 and that you might need to trade up for him. So that's pretty happy news to see that the Packers were able to trade back from 41 and still get this guy, this guy who's going to be a starting linebacker on this team this year for, for new Green Bay Packers defensive coordinator, Jeff Halfley. Packers needed a linebacker and they went ahead and got the best one in the class. Say what you will about whether or not they need a corner. Okay. Clearly there's some disagreement between some fans and the Green Bay Packers front office. We all know that the Green Bay Packers do need a linebacker and they got the best one available. And when the pick came in, my very first reaction was that this is a Packers profile right off the bat. What are things that the Packers value? They value guys with high athletic measurables. And Cooper has a 9.1 relative athletic score. That's on a scale from one to 10. Anything above nine is the cutoff where the Packers are probably going to really like you. They like guys who play at power five schools, big, big blue chip schools, big top flight programs. And Edger and Cooper is out of Texas A&M. They like guys who have a lot of college production. Cooper was a first team all American this year. And young guys, guys under 23 years old. And he is that uh, Adrian Cooper is 23 years old and 22 years old and does not celebrate his next birthday until November in 2023. Adrian Cooper recorded 17 tackles for loss to lead the SEC. As a linebacker. He had eight sacks. Okay. That's excellent. Uh, thanks to Marcus Mosher of. The Locked On Network of Pro Football Focus. Uh, according to their PFF metrics, Edger and Cooper, this is ranked in the 98th percentile of run stop percentage, ranked in the 97th percentile of run defense grade, 96th percentile of coverage grade, 95th percentile of forced incompletion percentage, 95th percentile of box coverage grade. A guy who can certifiably defend the middle of the field and did so at an incredibly high level in college. Per pro football focus, Cooper was the only linebacker with an 85 plus grade in run defense, pass rush, and coverage in 2023. He's a guy with tremendous upside, tremendous upside. On top of that already clear college production, he has tremendous upside on top of all of that because he is so fast. He's incredibly athletic. He plays very fast. He has long arms, which help him in coverage, which help, which help him in tackling. He says that he tries to model his game after Fred and Warner. One of these 49ers uh, linebackers that we say the Packers really need really badly. Good. That's good. But Cooper does kind of take that speed, that top flight speed, and play a little bit out of control. It reminds me and, and I am not, again, kind of like what I said, something I said yesterday. This is not a bespoke take. The comparison you are seeing all over the place with Edger and Cooper is Quay Walker already on the Packers roster, which can be good, can be bad. They're both very versatile linebackers. Guys who can play multiple positions. They, they have some real high-end athletic talent. But they also lack some discipline, lack some polish. Walker, we talked about this during the season. Walker is among the most blitzed players in the league. Among the most, among the defensive players who are sent on blitzes the most in the league, most often. Part of that's because Quay Walker doesn't do that well in coverage. You, you hope, and I think... Edger and Cooper is going to be better in coverage. But you need that. You need that from Edger and Cooper for this draft pick to, to really, really, really hit. One of the things, though, that goes along with that comparison is that Cooper and Quay Walker are both incredibly versatile. They can play multiple positions. Pat Moore, the director of college scouting for the Green Bay Packers, said both Quay and Edger and Cooper 
can each play all three linebacker positions in Jeff Halfley's scheme. Brian Gutekinds said in his press conference on Friday night that they want guys who can be very multiple in the linebacker positions, and they don't want to sacrifice speed in a league that is increasingly about speed, increasingly about being fast, about playing sideline to sideline. They don't want to sacrifice speed just to get a bigger guy to play at the big linebacker position. And Edgerton Cooper fits this mold quite nicely because he's a bigger guy, but he's got a lot of that speed. I get why he fits exactly what the Packers need for this linebacker position. And Quay Walker and Edgerton Cooper are probably going to be on the field quite a bit going forward with Devontae Campbell out the door with a bad case of the old. Didn't stop there. Didn't stop there. 13 picks later, Brian Gutekinds got another big, big, big piece to this defense. This defense is going to look different. It is going to be speedy. It is going to be young. It is going to have some real, real, real talent on it now. Because aside from Edger and Cooper, Packers went back to the University of Georgia and got Javon Bullard at 58. He was 53rd on Dane Brugler's big board. And I'm realizing that I actually didn't check the consensus board. Uh, so we're going to do that in real time. Real time. This is recorded. Uh, he was 63rd on the consensus big board. So by that mark, you know, a little little bit um, of a stretch on the on the consensus board side, but a really good pick on big board on uh, Brugler sports side. A little bit of flip flop from the Adrian Cooper pick. Packers needed another starting safety. Shocking, shocking, right? They needed they needed a starting safety last year. Oh, they needed bodies in the room, and they needed a, and they needed a starter last year. They needed a starting safety to go alongside Xavier McKinney, who was excellent. Darnell Savage left in free agency. Bullard is maybe not the best safety in the class. There's an argument for him to be the best safety in the class. He's and I, I say maybe not. Because you, you could absolutely label him as the best safety in the class, and you're not going to hear people up in arms about it. I think he's top three at the worst. Probably top two. Another guy who's young, not even 22 years old yet. Yep, that's a Packers type. Played at Georgia. Yep, that's a Packers type. Versatility again. That's a Packers type. Brian Gutekind said specifically at the NFL Combine, as we talked about at the top of the show, that they wanted versatility in their safeties to play all three positions in, in the deep backfield. He has played free, strong and nickel at Georgia in 2022. When the Bulldogs won the national title, Bullard was the defensive MVP of both the peach bowl college football playoff semifinal that year and of the college football playoff national championship game, the defensive MVP in both of those games. In 2022, when he won those awards, Bullard was mostly a slot guy, played 510 snaps. In 2023, he played the field far more often. Played 362 snaps at free safety and 144 in the slot. And he still had a higher coverage grade in 2023, according to PFF. Uh, the Packers director of college scouting, again, Pat Moore, said it, after the second round that they really valued Bullard's ability to play nickel. And that kind of put him over the top for the other safeties. They said that they didn't draft Bullard with a specific position at safety, a specific alignment at safety in mind. And they were going to end up finding the best, best spot for him. It's not a guy who had the most high-end size. Not the guy who had the most high-end athletic measurables, necessarily. So that breaks a little bit with... Packers tendencies, but he's excellent in coverage. Did not allow a single touchdown in coverage in 2023. Yeah, that, the fact that he is from Georgia, that he can be very versatile as a safety position the Packers desperately need to start somewhere, to start anywhere. That he can come down and play in the box, that he can come down and line up at safety, that he can play well over the top. I think that's a better. 
bit fits a better need than what the Packers would have otherwise done to get a Cooper DeGene. I think the Edger and Cooper and Javon Bullard combo is better than what you might have otherwise obtained from a potential trade up that you would have needed to execute to get a Cooper DeGene. Maybe. Maybe. I'm not sure. Um, because if you don't have to include, you know, 50, 58 in that trade up, maybe you're able to get Cooper and Cooper. I'm not sure. I don't think so. Um, but this way, look, Packers made it really clear that they do not like what they have in that linebacker room right now. They made that really clear throughout the draft process at the NFL combine, Brian Gutekind said it. And tonight, Brian Gutekind signaled that, that they needed a linebacker. And they were very happy to get Edgerin Cooper to do that, but it didn't stop there. It didn't stop there. And we're going to talk about that on the back half of the show, but let's run through some of the other big things to happen in Wisconsin sports fandom tonight, because it started at 4 30 PM central on a Friday. So the Milwaukee bucks lose a heartbreaker. Just an absolute heartbreaker to the Indiana Pacers in double overtime, or not in double overtime. It looked like it was going to go to double overtime for a second. A thriller where the Bucks were getting doubled up early. Doubled up. Damian Lillard leaves the game for a second with an apparent knee injury. Chris Middleton goes the heck off. Dam Damian Lillard comes back, and then Chris Middleton goes the heck off. Forces it to be a game. Chris Middleton hits a game tying three on a circus shot to force overtime. Hits in another absurd bank in three that looks like it's going to force a double overtime. But meanwhile, we don't have Dame taking the last shot because apparently he has re aggravated an Achilles injury. <laughs> and so he's just playing a decoy role in overtime, trying his best. The Bucs can't grab a rebound in overtime. Pascal Siakam is a problem. Bobby Portis is a problem for this Milwaukee Bucks team right now. Bobby Portis looks overmatched. He is not able to contend with what the Pacers have going on in the front court. There's also some points here where Bucks look a little bit old. Like, Brooke Lopez doesn't look like he has it. He looks old. He looks tired. It's rough against this Indiana Pacers team right now without Giannis Antetokounmpo. And, and the Bucks that were down big, down big early, and got the deficit miraculously down to seven going into the fourth quarter. Almost stole this one. And look, if Damian Lillard is going to be hurt, they needed to steal this one. They needed to steal this one. So that worst case scenario, it was 2-2 series before you get back to Milwaukee on Tuesday. Uh, and unfortunately, that is not going to be the case. Um, the Bucks game four against the Pacers, pivotal, pivotal game in this series now uh, is going to be on Sunday at 6 p.m. Central. I assume that's what we'll talk about on Monday's show. Uh, hopefully, I get to watch the game in full. But fortunately, I'll be able to uh, get the radio call no matter what. Got some other stuff going on on Sunday. Uh, but the Brewers doing some big, big, big things. The Brewers walk it off. On, on Friday night against the New York Yankees, Joey Ortiz has his first career home run in the major leagues. Plus, he ends up being the hero to walk it off in the bottom of the 11th. Big, big, big night uh, for, for Joey Ortiz there. Uh, and you can come out again tonight. Tonight on Saturday night as the Milwaukee Brewers take on the New York Yankees. In game two of that series, that game starting at 6, 10 p.m. at American Family Field. And I'll be there. Uh, already got notified by another friend of the show that they are going to be at the game. We'll be we'll be nice uh, seeing them catching up, saying saying some hellos to another friend of the show. If you're going to be at that game uh, on, on Saturday night, let me know. Let me know in the comments. Uh, shoot me a DM on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at Kedrick Stumbrus. Uh, get there. Get, get your uh, City Connect Tumblr. Uh, as as a free giveaway just for walking in the door keep keep your drinks cold and uh maybe maybe i'll be able to get you one as well 
uh, because I can afford it thanks to saving some money on TickPick. Um, <laughs> uh, because TickPick is where I get tickets to every sporting event, including this uh, Brewers game that I will be at tomorrow night. Uh, and I get them there because TickPick is the only place that I can go and buy tickets with no fees, no fees for sporting events, concerts, comedy shows, whenever I buy tickets on TickPick. Oh, that's interesting. Um, TickPick is going to get you the best price on tickets to any live event. If it's a brewing, if it's a Bucks playoff game, looking at getting some tickets on TickPick for that too, uh, for game five on Tuesday. Maybe I'll, I'll wait until I find out uh, how game th or how game four goes um, before that happens. But when you use TickPick, you're never going to pay service or delivery fees ever for tickets ever again. And if you use my link in the podcast description, you're going to save 10 bucks on your first order. So go to the Google Play Store, go to the Apple App Store, download the TickPick app. That's T-I-C-K, P-I-C-K. Download the TickPick app, click my link in the podcast description, and never, never, pay fees on tickets ever again save 10 bucks on your first order on TickPick when you use my link in the podcast description uh like i said coming up this week on the show we're going to be talking more about um the milwaukee bucks on on monday i imagine we'll we'll have a little bit of some recap about the day three of the nfl draft for the green bay packers as well uh, i am hoping to line up some guests to help us break down some of these Green Bay Packers picks a little bit more in depth. And that should be exciting. That will happen next week. Um, we also maybe, maybe might be getting some Wisconsin Badgers transfer portal news uh, in the, in the coming days ish. Uh, we have some other Wisconsin Badgers recruiting news that I have up right now in my latest story on Badger notes. You can find that linked in the podcast description. I spoke with a big time Wisconsin basketball recruit uh, who is currently on campus in Madison. Uh, you can find my notes on his recruitment and the conversation I had with him linked in my podcast description over on Badger notes. Uh, but meanwhile, as we try to figure out what the heck is going on in the transfer portal for the Wisconsin Badgers, I am also trying to find, figure out what Brian Gutekunst was doing in the third round for the Green Bay Packers. Because it was a little bit confusing. Uh, the first pick, and these happened back to back, because the Packers picked at 88 and then 91. It was rapid fire. And at 88, the Packers took a running back, something I kind of expected them to do. Um, it ends up being Marshawn Lloyd out of USC, which USC both. Uh, he spent a couple of years at South Carolina. And then he ended up transferring to Southern Cal. He's the 88th pick was 91st on Brugler's big board. And this dude is fast. He is a fast guy. He put on 10 pounds just before the combine too. He, he is a slightly bigger guy uh, from weights, weight perspective, a shorter guy. So short stout, uh, but put on a full 10 pounds and still ran a 44640, a full tenth of a second faster than Aaron Jones. Obviously, running the 40 is not something that uh, most running backs are doing in the middle of the game. So have what it is. Um, but when the Packers took a running back here, it was in the range for some other fan favorite running backs, basically. When you look at Brugler's big board, the next three running backs on the board were Jalen Wright out of Tennessee, who that kid, that kid runs very, very, very fast. Uh, Marshawn Lloyd and then Braylon Allen. So I don't know exactly what the Packers thought of Braylon Allen, but by draft position and what was available and the position taken here seems somewhat realistic that Braylon Allen could have been the pick here and the Packers liked Marshawn Lloyd more, of course. Um, in 2023, Marshawn Lloyd missed or forced 47 missed tackles on 115 carries that 115 carries. Keep that in mind. It's a small number. It is a small number, but on those small number of carries, Marshawn Lloyd averaged 7.1 yards. He averaged nearly four yards after contact as a receiver. He only had one drop, but it was only on 34 total receptions. 
for his career, <laughs> including 13 last year. On those 13 receptions last year, it was an average of 17.8 yards per catch. He did say on the conference call with the media uh, after his selection that he is a very willing pass protector, that he knows that that's kind of the thing that keeps you on the field as a running back. It's not a lot of production, though, and not necessarily because, you know, he couldn't produce. It's just that those opportunities weren't entirely there, which is the interesting thing to figure out and to tease out with this pick is what exactly are you getting? Or are the Packers more interested in, oh, we're getting a lot in terms of production available to us because he only has 291, was it? Yeah, 291 career carries in college. 291 touches the rock. 291 carries plus the 34 receptions. So a little bit over, you know, 300 total touches. But it's a very small sample size to figure out exactly what this guy is. I know there's some stuff that there's a little bit of a higher number of fumbles than you would like. Uh, Brian Gutekinds in his press conference on Friday evening said that they looked at the tape and they thought those were correctable mistakes, teachable moments. One thing that comes to mind is Green Bay Packers new running back Josh Jacobs, who is now on the roster, has a very, very, very significant number of carries over the last few seasons. There might be something here where you say we can bring in a young guy. And because he doesn't have a lot of tread on the tires, we can we can work him. We can work him and try to get, you know, that average number of carries per year over the last running, you know, three, four years of Jacob's career down more because we're we're going to work Marshawn Lloyd quite a bit. Uh, I would imagine that's part of the calculation here, but it, it also comes with the fact that AJ Dillon's still on the roster. So what is the overall roster impact that Marshawn Lloyd is happening here or is having here? Marshawn Lloyd could keep AJ Dillon off of the roster, theoretically, if he stands out enough in, in preseason camp. Dillon's contract is expendable. He can be cut and it's not going to do real damage to the Packers. Not going to do damage at all. Um, Josh Jacobs is more of a bowling ball build like Dylan and bowling ball runner. We talked about the fact that Marshawn Lloyd is kind of built that same way, short and stout. Dylan is 25 pounds heavier, but Josh Jacobs is more of a power runner. Marshawn Lloyd is more of a speedy guy, a, a, a change of pace, but change the pace in a different direction than you would normally think a, a change of pace back uh, comes in for. This is kind of the same model as the Packers had when the Packers drafted AJ Dillon in the first place with Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams still on the roster. And both those guys were entering contract years. AJ Dillon is entering contract year after getting one year deal. There's a, there's a chance here that, if Marshawn Lloyd shows up in camp and shows up in a big way, AJ Dillon could end up off of this roster because the Packers decide not to carry a third running back. They're they're fine going whatever way with you know whatever emergency guys they have on the practice squad again. Or, you know, if that's Manuel Wilson, if that's whoever. I don't know. We we will see who ends up being that that second and third running back for the Packers because I, I think this puts this, I think the Marshawn Lloyd pick puts that very much into question. The other big question mark is Tyron Hopper. Tyron Hopper is the Packers pick at 91. Another linebacker, this time out of Missouri. And I don't really get it. I don't really get it. I haven't, I, I've seen people who like Hopper. 
but I don't know that I've seen people making a full-throated defense of the pick yet. I think it's something of a reach. He was taken at 91. Arif Hassan's consensus draft board had Hopper at 153. Brugler had a fifth round grade. Okay. He's a low relative athletic score at 7.42. He was bad at the ag agility drills in particular, which I know the Packers do value. I'm a bit surprised. Brian Gutekunst on Friday night spoke about Hopper and said that he they were really impressed with his 40 time. So I guess they were impressed enough with his speed to take him. And and of course, at, you know, earlier in the show, we talked about the fact that Brian Gutekunst is valuing that speed, talking about speed being increasingly important in the National Football League. Sarah Hopper's birthday today, by the way, too, uh, which is interesting. He just turned 23. Um, <laughs> so also kind of above the the regular age threshold that the Packers would would normally want to have. Um, he's taken a lot of snaps in his career, eight, 825 in coverage in which he is only allowed one touchdown according to pro football focus. So that is good. Second team, all sec talent out of Missouri this season. He started at Florida. So two different programs in the sec is willing to take him. He's also played a lot of special team snaps. Uh, Edger and Cooper has played a decent amount of special team snaps too. the other linebacker that Brian Gutekinds took on Friday night. Overall, Tyron Hopper is not a top flight athlete, but he looks okay in coverage. And when I was looking at that, when I was taking in what I could very quickly in terms of, you know, small amounts of highlight tape and, and digests and scouting reports from from people that I trust. The thing that came to mind was this just feels like the profile of a player who's going to see some real special teams time. And I think aside that he will also push Isaiah McDuffie for snaps at linebacker. It, it is clear. The Packers do not like their, their linebacker room and they must like Hopper. They, they must like Hopper because they took him here. Very interesting that they thought they needed to take him here. But when my initial thought was, it feels like a special teams -y kind of a player. I later came to find out I, I was not the only one who had that initial impression because Zach Jacobson of Packer Report, uh, 247 Sports Green Bay Packers website, had a note on the website formerly known as Twitter and said, this might be short-sighted, but Teron Hopper reminds me of the Oren Burks pick six years ago. I don't think he's going to have the opportunity to crack any kind of rotation in the Packers defense. This is a purely special team selection. I don't know. Could be that that was, that was my initial reaction and we will see. Uh, I know we are going along. It is 12, 10 AM here. I've already brushed my teeth before I started the show. I am turning this off and I'm going the heck to bed because it's been a long day of watching baseball, of watching basketball of watching the NFL draft, of preparing this show, of listening to Brian Gutekind speak, of listening to draft picks speak on conference calls. Been a long day. And then tomorrow we get to run it all back. Get to go to a Brewers game. As the Green Bay Packers have eight more picks. And Brian Gutekind tonight did not rule, tonight on Friday night, did not rule out the idea of trading back and accumulating more draft capital. Oh, the Packers only have one fourth round pick. So they have seven picks between rounds five, six, and seven. Tanner Bordellini has not been picked yet. Braylon Allen has not been picked yet. So they are still all the Wisconsin Badgers on the board. If you are going to sit through day three of the draft, uh, good for you because that is not my cup of tea. Uh, but I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you have enjoyed your morning with Six Pack, the Scotty Six Pack, the only podcast talking all things Wisconsin sports with you six days a week. Packers, Badgers, Brewers, Bucks, and beyond. You can find me, your host, Kedrick Stumbris, on the website, formerly known as Twitter, at Kedrick Stumbris. And follow the podcast at Scotty Six Pack. 
for the latest updates in Wisconsin sports. Um, let me know down in the comments what you thought about day one and day two of the NFL draft for the Green Bay Packers. Because I was very, very, very happy with the round two picks and kind of held my nose at the round three picks. I knew they needed a running back. Didn't necessarily think Packers would take one this high. Doesn't totally surprise me. But the Hopper pick does does surprise me. Uh, and I am interested to to listen to people who are maybe more informed than I am. Um, and who at least have differing opinions on it, because I would love to be convinced otherwise uh, off of my opinion of this pick. While you are here in the comments, uh, subscribe to the show on, on YouTube, youtube.com slash at Scotty six pack. You can subscribe for free. Hit that like button. Subscribe on your podcast platform of choice. Leave a kind review. Five stars really helps the show uh, will help us garner more traction and bring on great guests like we did earlier this week with Ryan. Uh, and we're attempting to line up some guests to talk about these Green Bay Packers draft picks very, very, very soon. Uh, until then, until we talk to you all again on Monday on Wisconsin. Oh, go back, go. That's the one I'm supposed to say. <laughs> Bucks and six.